Okay, hello and welcome to Science Stories from Palamarin. Oh, let me start my video. There we go. Um, I am Christy Davala, principal ecologist at Point Blue Conservation Science and your host for this webinar series. If you haven't already, you should hopefully be seeing a poll question in a pop-up window if you're joining us on Zoom, asking where is home to you? And the options start with the San Francisco Bay Area and include increasingly larger areas around there. Uh, and you can choose more than one if you consider multiple places home. Since we'll be talking about bird migration today uh, and the many places birds might consider home, we'd love to know how you define your home. We'll give just a few more seconds for people to answer that question. Uh, and no matter where home is or where you're joining us from, we're so glad you're here today for episode four of our webinar series, Crossroads and Connections. We have three excellent scientists lined up to talk with you about bird migration research and how important this work is for conservation. Uh, before we bring them on, let me set the stage a little bit. Um, if you're new to Point Blue, welcome. We are a nonprofit science organization and our mission is to advance the conservation of birds, other wildlife and ecosystems through science partnerships and outreach. Our work stretches from the Sierra Nevada out into the Pacific Ocean and from Alaska to Antarctica. This webinar series is focused on the Palomarine Field Station, which is located in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Palo is very much the heart of Point Blue. It's our original headquarters and has been an active field station year round for over 50 years. And it's where many of us train to become the conservation scientists we are today. So uh, Palo is normally open to the public for visitors, but for now we remain closed to keep our staff and interns safe. Hopefully that will change sometime soon. Uh, but in the meantime, to help make Palomarin a little bit more accessible to you all, last summer we launched the Palomarin Field Station Data Explorer, which is a series of interactive web pages where you can dive into some of the most important science stories emerging from our long term research and find out why it's so important that we're able to continue collecting these data. You can find the Data Explorer at pointblue.org slash Data Explorer, and we hope you'll visit after today's webinar. Um, in this webinar series, we're exploring each of those major science stories further in conversation with the scientists and partners who have contributed to them. Today, we're focusing on bird migration and how new technology is allowing us to figure out that Palomarin really serves as a crossroads for many different bird species migrating along the Pacific Flyway. Uh, this map gives an overview of some of our mig migration research to date that we'll be talking about today. Uh, showing where individual birds we've marked at the Palomarin Field Station, which is shown by the Point Blue logo in the center of the map there, um, where individual birds have traveled from Palo, giving us a much better sense of the multiple places these birds might call home. Uh, but Palo is also a crossroads for people, including at least 700 interns from 23 countries who have spent at least one field season training with us and including many of our supporters, donors, and visitors like you who come from all over. Um, and let me just share the results of our poll here. Um, so the majority of you are coming from the Bay Area, but we do have quite a lot of people from elsewhere in California or in the United States and even from around the world. Um, so we have a, another quick poll question for you. Let me see here. There we go. Uh, to get your perspective on a conservation question, where do you think are the most important locations for bird conservation? And here we're thinking about the breeding grounds where they nest, on the wintering grounds where they spend the winter, or on migration stopovers where they stop to rest and refuel along the way. And again, you can choose more than one, but we're just curious about the perspective you all are bringing in today. Okay, well, those are coming in. I'll give you a little bit more time. Um, while you're answering the poll, I wanted to let you know we are saving some time to answer your questions. So if you're joining us in Zoom, you can submit questions for any of our speakers at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you run into any technical issues with Zoom, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it later. Uh, or you can try joining us on our Facebook live stream, which is also running right now. For those of you joining us on Facebook, we will also be looking for any questions that come through in the comments there. So feel free to ask away. Okay, let's see. Looks like it's slowing down. Let me end this. 
and share our results. We look pretty split, uh, <laughs> um, pretty even voting for all three seasons. Um, so it looks like we have a, a range of perspectives and maybe many of you chose all three, uh, but we hope our con conversation today may expand your perspective and get you thinking about migratory connectivity and conservation in a new way. Uh, so thanks again for joining and let's get to it. I'm gonna turn it over to Renee Cormier, Point Blue Avian Ecologist and Palomarin Intern Supervisor who has been deeply involved in our migratory connectivity research. Renee will give you an overview of today's topic and we'll then be interviewing our two guest scientists. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Christy. Um, so you're all likely familiar with the concept of migration, the movement of animals from one region to another, often seasonal for many species, but it can be a permanent movement such as for many human migrations. Um, all types of animals migrate from insects to mammals and of course many bird species. Um, an early uh, image for me um, was seeing Canada geese in bee formation. Since 2010, re researchers around the world and Palomarin have been able to use, um, oh, excuse me, I'm <laughs> on my wrong, wrong note here. Um, so to cons conserve migratory species, it's important to consider all parts of their annual cycle. So not just one place where we may know them best. Um, for example, swains and thrushes um, spend their winters in the blue areas on the map from Mexico to South America and breed in spring summer in the orangish region in coastal California um, and across Canada and Alaska while stopping at migratory sites along the, um, on the, along the way in the yellow regions. For a long time, most birds, um, we have known their general breeding, wintering, and migratory ranges, um, but for many songbird species, we don't know where they go within those different colored regions. So for example, for the swains and thrushes that live here in the Bay Area during spring and summer, um, where do they go within the blue region during winter? And do they all go to the same general area within the blue? Or do they spread out over a broad range? Um, we use the term migratory connectivity to describe this. So migratory connectivity would be strong if all the birds went to the same location and weak if they spread out throughout the range. So knowing precisely where migratory birds go and how they're connected between different areas can help us better understand the challenges they face and the opportunities for their conservation. So for example, if a species is declining in one region, it might be due to factors happening in that location or it could be um, something impacting their other home thousands of kilometers away um, or a combination of factors. Additionally, climate change is not producing the same changes equally across the globe. So some areas are experiencing greater temperature changes while others may have more severe droughts or bigger or more frequent storms. Um, so understanding where birds go will be an essential part um, to help us understand future challenges. Um, since 2010, researchers around the world and at Palomarin have been able to use newly miniaturized technologies to help us unlock the mysteries of migration. And finally, after so many years of studying songbirds, we can determine where these different individuals are going. Um, and so we use both GPS and light level technology to track birds. Um, the GPS tag is shown in black on the left and the green tag is um, the light level tag. They look very similar. Um, the GPS tags operate just like the GPS in your phone, um, except that we program them um, to take a position um, for a bird's location on a specific date and time. And we attach these um, geolocators to birds using a little backpack harness. Um, so you can see in the golden crown sparrow on the right hand side of the screen, um, the tag is shown between the wings. Um, the light level tags work a little differently in that they have a light sensor and a clock. And so with that data, we can determine sunrise and sunset and day length, which then we can calculate their, um, their location. So we essentially attach these tiny tags to songbirds using a backpack harness, they migrate, and when they return, we remove the tags, download the data, and see where they went. So from the map that Christy showed earlier with the locations for where individual birds went from Palo, we could see how we're all connected to so many other places beyond the field station. 
And that map was just for a few species. So I'm going to highlight two of our studies where we looked at species that spend some of their time at Palomarin, but we also compared them to birds that live in other parts of California during those same periods. Um, the golden crown sparrow and the Swainson's thrush. So the golden crown sparrow is a migratory species that spends summers from Alaska south to British Columbia and the mountains of Ala oh, Alberta. And in winter, you can find golden crown sparrows in the orange area from southwest Canada to northern Baja and Mexico. From our first study using geolocators out of Palomarin in 2010, we tracked golden crown sparrows and we got results from four individuals. Um, and they all went to um, areas along the Gulf Coast of Alaska, although spread out. Um, so these were super exciting results um, for us, our first geolocator studies. And we wanted to see if that pattern would hold if we um, tagged more individuals from Palomarin. We also wanted to know if we tagged birds from a more inland wintering locations, um, in, and we chose an area in the foothills east of Sacramento, um, shown on the map with the yellow star. Um, we wanted to know if they would migrate to areas that were different from where the Palomarin birds went. So this map shows what we found. And for the most part, tagging more Palomarin birds, um, we found that most, but not all, went to areas along the Gulf Coast of Alaska. So the Palomarin birds are the blue crosses. Um, but the birds that we tagged in the foothills east of Sacramento, the orange crosses, typically went to breeding sites that were more inland. So these results really highlighted that birds that wintered relatively closely in, in distance ended up quite spread out from each other during the breeding season. And these two groups of birds also took different migratory routes. So another example um, showing how this technology can be applied to the conservation and understanding differences among bird populations is with the Swainson's thrush. Um, the Swainson's thrush in Marin County and along the coast is a relatively common local breeder um, with a stable population here. And while in the mountain areas of California, they occur in very low numbers, um, and it's thought that they were once abundant there. So Palomarin biologists recently partnered with Point Blue's Sierra Nevada team and the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, and we used geolocators to track where the birds went. We got some exciting results. Um, the Palomarin birds mostly wintered in we Western Mexico. The birds we tagged in the Lassen area went primarily to Central America, while the Tahoe birds went um, to Northern South America. Then we evaluated from those results relative forest loss for the areas where each group bred and overwintered. And we found that forest loss was greater in the breeding and wintering regions of the two Cascade Sierra populations, so the Tahoe and Lassen birds, than compared to those of the coastal birds. Um, this forest loss combined with the longer migration distances of those Lassen and Tahoe birds suggests greater vulnerability um, of those swains and thrushes compared to the ones that breed on the coast. Um, so these results demonstrate that for some species, quantifying uh, migra migration distances and destinations across a relatively small distance among these breeding populations, in this case 140 to 250 kilometers apart, can identify dramatically different um, vulnerabilities that need to be considered in conservation planning. Um, so with a bit of background on this work, um, now I want to transition and introduce and welcome our first guest scientist, who I've been really um, fortunate to be working with the last couple of years. Um, Autumn Iverson is a conservation ecologist, a PhD student in the ecology program at the University of California, Davis, and a National Geographic explorer. She's investigating songbird movement ecologies, specifically with golden crown sparrows, and the impact of environmental change using data from stable isotopes and GPS telemetry. Autumn received her Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Biology from UC San Diego. Um, and before going to UC Davis, she spent about 14 years working both around the country and abroad in the conservation ecology field. Welcome, Autumn. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so, Autumn, you're doing some really interesting research with golden crown sparrow migration for your dissertation. Um, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to this topic and how you got connected with Palo? Yeah, sure. So, I 
have been interested in songbird migration for many, many years. <laughs> um, previous to starting my PhD, uh, you know, focusing on golden crown sparrows, I was actually working on sea turtle migration for uh, almost a decade. And so really just wildlife movement in general has always been something I'm very, I'm very interested in, but there's just something about tiny birds traveling thousands of kilometers that's just really interesting and exciting to me. And I really wanted to learn more. Um, so in, you know, figuring out a research project for the PhD, I, I came across Point Blue's website and saw all the amazing work that Paolo was doing. And that's, you know, what initiated me reaching out. And um, I have to say that it has been just so positive and wonderful um, working with everyone at Point Blue, just so many friendly, amazing, knowledgeable people that um, were so great and just really open to a collaboration to work on this project. And um, really that, that knowledge and that help really created, made this project, you know, at as good as it could be, I think. Um, so yeah, like you guys helped me with everything from project development, you know, which species is the right species here for, for what, uh, what we can do and um, how to put on GPS tags, picking a field site. And then Renee specifically, also a lot of seed <laughs> being put out, <laughs> so much seed. Um, and so anyway, all of this really just, I think, helped create a great project. And from that, I was actually able to raise money from National Geographic, which has been really good for my career in general as well. So all around a very positive experience. That's excellent. And yeah, it's always um, interesting to hear about how sea turtle research can lead to bird research and, and how there's so many um, interconnections between those, those types of different research um, avenues. Um, so you are using multiple technologies in your research. Um, can you tell us a little more about what those are and what each of them add to the story of migration? Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm using both GPS tags and stable isotopes. So just to start with the, the GPS tags, they are one gram tags. The, the picture that you showed earlier is, is a picture of them. So they're actually the smallest tag currently available for GPS um, tracking. And that makes golden crown sparrows one of the smallest species that can carry one of these tags. So that's really exciting because um, as you mentioned before, GPS tags um, are, you, you can get like a, a very you know, pinpointed location within 10 meters you can get um, from a GPS tag, whereas the locators, it's a little bit, little bit fuzzier. And so this provides an opportunity to really get some fine scale details um, on where the birds are stopping on their migration route, uh, where the breeding grounds are. For golden crown sparrows, you know, a lot of their breeding grounds is up in, they're up in very remote places in Alaska and Canada that are difficult to physically reach and study. So um, from these locations, we're able to get a better understanding of the habitat that they're using and the places that are important to the birds. So that's really exciting. Um, sort of the downside of GPS tags is that they're expensive. Um, and like you mentioned, you have to get them back. So um, we were able to put out 50 tags altogether. Um, and to get a tag back means you have to get the bird back, obviously. Um, that's all the seed that you were putting out to you know, encourage them to come back into the traps. Um, so we did, um, com comparative to you know, a lot of GPS studies out there, I think we did a really good job. We got 22 tags back with usable information, which was really great. Um, but still 22, 22 GPS tags is great, but 22 birds compared to the, you know, however many birds are out there is still a pretty small sample size. So that's where stabilized tools um, came in as another tool to try to broaden the sample size. Um, and so, okay, what are, what are stable isotopes? <laughs> um, this could be a really long explanation, but I'll just keep it sort of simple here. You're essentially counting the number of neutrons. So you're getting down to the atomic level, which is really cool. And you're counting the number of neutrons in different elements in a feather. So a feather is grown on the breeding grounds. It is locking in that information from its environment from those elements. Um, and then when, you, when that bird flies down to California for the wintering uh, time, you can take one of the feathers, analyze it, and kind of get an idea of where that feather was from. So I'm specifically looking at hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen. Hydrogen offers um, 
it, it relates to broad scale precipitation patterns and carbon and nitrogen are more related to habitat type. So, um, basically with this, you can, you can estimate a region, sort of a broad region of where the probability of, you know, that feather being grown there. So again, it's a bit fuzzier. You don't get that exact point, um, but you can get a larger sample size. And so there's some trade-offs and I think that they're nice and complementary to each other. Excellent. Yeah, the um, multiple methods is always something that we are um, huge proponents of at Point Blue, and and you know the complementary data you can get is always um, a nice component of of research. Um, so I know your research is still a work in progress, Autumn. But um, what are you expecting to discover, and have you um, encountered any surprises so far? Yeah. Um... I think one of the most exciting things for me about what I'm looking to discover is really pinpointing those, those stopping points along migration and trying to understand, you know, why that spot and not a different spot. So for songbirds like golden crown sparrows, you know, they can't fly for days and days and days on end and then stop. They have to, you know, stop very often. So most likely what's happening is they're leaving at night, they're flying for a few hours, then they stop. But why, you know, why there, why not, you know, 50 miles in a different direction? Um, and so I've got about 500 or so migration um, locations that I'm going to be looking at to see, you know, is there, is it habitat, is it weather, is there something else driving the choice and, and why they stop in certain places? So that's one thing that's really exciting to me. Um, as far as surprises, uh, I don't know if this was a total surprise, but it was really cool. We had three birds that were tra uh, tracked twice and um, all three of them went to the exact same breeding location uh, in subsequent years. So that was really cool to see. Um, and then the other thing that was really more of a surprise to me is that, so the GPS tagged birds came from Point Reyes and from Davis, which is about 40 or so miles more coastal than um, than the Sierra Foothills location that Renee was, was talking about. So in that geolocator study, um, the Sierra Foothills birds went more inland and the coastal birds stayed more coastal. So I was expecting the Davis birds to be more similar to those Sierra Foothills birds, but in fact, they were actually more similar to the coastal birds. And so um, that was a surprise and kind of, you know, questions about, you know, why that is, is there some sort of migratory divide between the two? Um, so yeah, more, more questions come up as, as it does in science. And so, yeah, exciting. Well, that's exciting. And I'm really looking forward to um, hearing more about what you learn and especially about those migratory stopover sites. Um, thank thank you. you so much, Autumn, for sharing about your um, fascinating work with us. Um, and we'll bring you back on for um, the audience Q&A pretty soon. Um, but for right now, I'm going to introduce our second guest scientist. Um, Dr. Nat Seavey is the Director of Migration Science for National Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative, where he works with the Audubon Science team to use the wealth of scientific knowledge about bird migration to engage people in the joy of migration and help them take action to protect the places that, places that matter most across the Americas. If Nat is familiar to those of you who have known Point Blue for a while, um, from 2009 to 2019, Nat was the research director of the Pacific Coast and Central Valley Group at Point Blue. Um, and I can say that he was a wonderful colleague and mentor, and I'm very happy to welcome him back today um, to talk with us about his work. Thank you, Renee. It's great to be back and uh, really appreciate the invitation and happy to be here. Awesome. Welcome. Um, Nat, when you were research director here at Point Blue, you helped initiate a lot of our migratory connectivity research that we've been doing at Palomarin. What sparked this new wave of research and your interest in it? Yeah, you know, it, it was really a matter of um, kind of being in the right place at the right time. And you know, looking back on it, there were three things that um, that happened that really made that possible at Palomarin. The first thing was that the technology finally got small enough, and the first um, the first way that it got small enough was with the light level geolocator tags, and then later on the GPS tags became available. But for the first time, we were able to to put those kinds of tags onto smaller birds. Um, 
And that had always been, you know, the, the second piece of it was that it had always been something that had been, um, you know, it was something that we wanted to do at the Palomarin Field Station in terms of better understanding where the birds go and understanding what um, conservation challenges they were being exposed to, not just um, during the time that they're at the in coastal California, but also when they're away at other parts of migration. And so um, we were also fortunate that um, our funders understood that that was an important component of the work that was going on in, at Palomarin and would contribute. And then finally, one of the things that's really unique about Palomarin is the long-term data banding data that's available there. So as, as Autumn and you have pointed out, one of the challenges with attaching these kinds of tags is that you need to recapture the same bird a year after they were originally tagged and take that, that tag off and download the data from it. And so in order to be able to do that, you need to have a good idea that you'll be able to recapture the same birds. So we were able to look back at the history of recaptures and identify species where we felt very confident that we'd be able to recapture them. So all of those led to our ability to do that at Palomarin where it would have really been much difficult to do it in other places. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you're now the Director of Migration Science at Audubon. Um, has your research experience at Palomarin influenced your current work and has your perspective on this research changed? Yeah, I think so. At Audubon, with, with Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative, we're looking to engage people in the joy of migration by, by making some of the science um, more readily available to people and, and also looking for ways to identify the important places for migratory birds and ensure that we're protecting those places for them. And one of the things that I've really carried with me um, to Audubon and to the work that we're doing now is just how much effort it takes to do a field project like you've described and like Autumn has described um, in terms of the time and energy to um, capture those birds safely and then return a year later. And so really recognizing that, um, you know, at Audubon we have um, a real opportunity to highlight the kind of research that you're doing at Palomarin Field Station and you know that Autumn is doing at UC Davis and provide a spotlight for those kinds of research and, and make sure that people know about that. And then also make sure that we're using that science that's coming out to um, inform our work in a way that makes sense for bird conservation. Nice. Yeah, it's really great to be able to pull all those different data sets together and really be able to tell the larger stories of all of these migration studies that, um, that are happening. Um, so it seems like we're all learning more every year about migratory connectivity for many individual species, um, but how do we put all of this information together and how does it inform conservation strategy? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we're really recognizing is that there's not going to be any single one approach that provides the answer for bird conservation across the hemisphere. And I think your example of the Swainson's thrush study is, um, that's, it's really a good guide for what we need to be thinking about. And so recognizing that um, your approach to conserving Swainson's thrushes in coastal California might be very different from what you would do in the Sierra Nevada because those birds go different places. They're exposed to different conservation challenges across that migratory journey and then the places that they spend the non-breeding season. So I think our opportunity is to think about, okay, how do we use that information that we now have and build that into our conservation programs in such a way that we're connecting people, right? We're ensuring that people in different places um, have an understanding about where their birds are going for the time that they're away and what they can do to protect them in the place that they are and also help people in other areas steward those birds as well. Yeah, that's, that's such an important thing to have those connections and really, really understand how, how and where these birds are going and, and the connections to different places that we all have. Um, well, thank you, Nat and Autumn, also for your, the thoughtful responses um, and for your work on these important conservation issues. Um, 
Now I'm going to turn it back to Christy for a chance um, to take questions from folks watching this. So we'll all come back. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much to Renee and Autumn and Matt. That was a great conversation. Um, we have saved some time to answer audience questions. So feel free to submit your question uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you haven't already uh, or in the comments on our Facebook live stream. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, before we start with those, I just want to remind you quickly to please check out the Palabrin Field Station Data Explorer. This is our interactive website that lets you dive into our decades of data, including some of the stories you've heard about today and links to some of those papers um, to make sure you hear about future webinars uh, in this series and other Point Blue events. You can sign up for our email list and you can also follow us on all of the socials, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. We do also have a live bird banding demonstration planned for uh, Friday, July 23rd that you'll be able to find on Facebook. Um, we are also a nonprofit science organization that relies on donations to support our conservation research, our intern training, and our public outreach efforts like this. So if you enjoy this webinar and would like to support our conservation efforts, please consider giving us a donation at pointblue.org slash donate. We have some donors attending today who have been supporting Point Blue and Palomarin for decades, um, and we're so grateful uh, for your support. Um, okay, let me turn off this slide and then go to audience questions. Um, where am I? Okay. Um, so we had one, the first question that came in, um, which was uh, how is, so several of you talked about the size of these tags becoming small enough for, for birds, for these smaller songbirds. And so um, one question is how is the weight of the GPS locators related to the bird's weight? And, um, what is the rule or is there a percentage to select an individual or to select a species? And maybe I'll, maybe, maybe I'll ask Autumn, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, there, there usually is a rule of thumb. Um, generally not over 5% of the bird's body weight. Uh, some people like to aim more for, you know, 3%. three percent. Uh, the way we approached it was to take the lean body weight. So that is Kind of subtract out off whatever fat they're carrying, um, kind of estimate the grams of that, and then use that as our basis for the percentage. And so we were, you know, in between. We were under, definitely under five percent, maybe closer to four percent. Um, and yeah, for some studies that can impact the individuals you choose. And for example, if you know males are larger, females are larger, that might affect um, your sex ratio, or if you know. Yeah, so luckily for us though, we didn't have that problem. Um, we were able to get a, a wide variety of individuals and not just, uh, just the hefty ones, but, but a pretty broad range, so yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, and I guess related to that, I, I'm curious maybe for Renee, um, what do we know about how safe these tags are for, for birds maybe compared to regular banding operations at Palomarin and what kinds of safety practices or guidelines do you follow? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in addition to being really um, conscientious about weight um, of the study species and the individuals that receive tags, um, we also, um, for, every, for every geolocator study that we're doing, for every bird that receives a tag, we also band a bird that doesn't receive a tag. And um, we call this our control group. So let's say we have 30 tagged birds, we'll have 30 control birds. And we do all take all the same measurements and, and ban the birds in the same way. And we'll compare um, return rates. So in other words, um, what's the ratio or what's the proportion of birds with tags that migrated and returned compared to the proportion of birds, control birds that did the same thing. And we're looking for differences. Like if we had a lower proportion of tag birds return, um, that might tell us there's something, some negative impact um, on tagged birds, for example. And so we've been doing these with every group. So we haven't um, yet found differences between those control birds and the tagged birds, um, but we do really, um, you know, believe in the importance of having these control groups and constantly assessing like what's the best harness um, type and, and all of these um, different types of variables that um, can prioritize bird safety. 
Yeah, yeah, that's super important to keep track of. Um, and I've seen that there's a couple of kind of just related questions about that, but I think I think we've answered them. Um, that's great. I, um, I'm curious too, we've talked a bit about just kind of the advances in technology um, from the light level to the GPS. And um, there's one question here and, and I'm curious about what's next. What do you see on the horizon? Is there any new technology coming or um, kind of what's the, what's the next level or what would we like to be able to track? Yeah, I, I can talk just a little bit about that. And, you know, one thing, you know, the light level piece was so interesting because essentially what those tags do is they record the light across the entire day, every day that a bird is away traveling. And then you basically use the information about the sun elevation angle. So that's the exact same technology that was being used on old time ships to record latitude and longitude. That's that same technology that we were using off those tags, right? So then we advanced to the GPS tags that are using the satellite um, technology. You get a much more accurate position. And there's a couple of really exciting things coming up. One is that there's a new antenna on the space station called, and that's the Icarus program. And Icarus will allow, um, you basically need a much um, weaker signal that it can, it's much more sensitive. So it can um, pick up a weaker signal and you don't need as big of a battery on board. And so that will allow those tags to come down even to a smaller size and record continuous tags. So unlike the GPS tags that we were talking about where you only get maybe 20, 25 locations, something like that throughout the year, those Icarus tags will have continuous data. Um, so that's one really exciting thing. The other thing is um, like Autumn was talking about in terms of um, the isotope data where you can take a sample from a bird and get an idea from where it came from. There's some really exciting work going on with genetic data. And so essentially taking, you know, it's very similar to you build a big library across the breeding range that helps you understand genetic variation. And then you can take a sample on the wintering range and connect it to a population. So it's, it's similar to some of the tools that we use for something like ancestry.com or, or one of these other things that help you understand where, where your ancestors are from. That's, that's a similar technology that's using that. So the Bird Genoscape Project is doing some really exciting work around that. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, did Renee or Autumn, did you want to add anything to that question? Um, I just wanted to say that I'm also really excited about the Icarus tags. <laughs> um, from what I understand, we also don't have to get them back. I'm not sure, maybe not you said that, but, um, and, and yes, just a small, I did get about 60 points per tag, I'm a little more than 25, so. <laughs> but yeah, really exciting stuff. Uh, that's gonna, I think, change the landscape of, of what we can do and what questions we can answer soon. That's great. Um, let's see, I, I see a question here. Um, maybe I'll ask Renee, uh, what are all the species that you've tracked migrations of and um, have you tracked different species with different methods or, um, are there some species that you, you know, can't use certain methods for or just didn't work or, um, yeah, any other stories to share there? Yes, um, those are, that's a great question. Um, so we have so far tracked, let's see, golden crown sparrow, fox sparrow, Swainson's thrush, black-headed grosbeak, and I think that I'm forgetting one, hermit thrush, did I already say that? Um, and we've done all a mix of the light level and GPS tags so far. Um, there's definitely a suite of species that breed around Palo that we haven't been able to tag yet because of their small size, like uh, Wilson's warbler, for example, warbling vireo would be really neat um, to tag. And, um, you know, some considerations of like who we tag and who we don't is um, how many birds come back the following year. So that that is definitely um, one of the things that we know from our long-term data. Nat mentioned earlier that we can say, okay, well, we know that swains and thrushes that breed at Palo tend to come back year after year. And so that would be a good species 
um, to fit with a tag. And, and that was why they were um, such a great study species. Um, where it didn't go as well was uh, one species that we tagged with a black-headed grosbeak. Um, Nat will remember these um, days <laughs> fondly. Um, black-headed grosbeak tends to be less territorial than um, a lot of the other species that we study and a little bit harder to, to catch. And so we were tagging them along creeks in Run County and um, they, they didn't return at as high of rates or they just didn't, they weren't so territorial. Um, and so they made themselves very challenging to catch. We were putting stacking nets super high in trees and putting out um, food and fruit for them and using playback. So um, playing other black headed gross beak songs to try to lure them in and we had decoys and we tried all kinds of things and, and that was a less successful um, project in terms of um, catching those birds. Again, they were outsmarting us most of the summer, but um, that's, that's how we learn in science sometimes is by having those little bit of failures. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I guess we'll have to use some different methods for those guys. Um, thank you. Um, let's see here. I am curious if any of you have uh, traveled to the places your birds go um, or plan to, um, or if you collaborate with researchers or conservation organizations in Alaska or in Central, Amer Central America on the other ends of these migration routes and, um, and how that works. Maybe I'll <laughs> I can start. Okay. I um I have been to Alaska, not specifically to you know the breeding grounds that I found from the GPS points. Um, although that would be a lot of fun because Alaska is amazing and beautiful. Um, but I I have collaborated with um, a bird observatory up in Nanaimo, British Columbia, to get some feather samples actually from there, which is sort of the the northern edge of the wintering range. So um, that's pretty exciting and um, yeah. That's great. Uh, Nat, did you wanna add? I, I will just add that um, <clears throat> one of the, the highlights of birding for me was a few years ago, there was an ornithology meeting up in Alaska and Tom Cardali and I took a day off and went up into the mountains and found um, breeding golden crown sparrows up there. And um, that was just really something, it was really special to see those birds. Again, probably you know, not the ones that came immediately from Palo, but as close as we've come to that. And, so that was, that was one of the things that was really fun. That was a bird that I've never seen breeding before. Yeah, well, did you happen to go to Hatcher's Pass? Yeah, same, totally agree. So beautiful. <laughs> also, it was really striking how much they would sing up there. I was gonna say, it must be fascinating to see just different behavior and a totally different environment from what they experience in. California, you know, in semi-urban parks and things um, to, to these really remote places in Alaska. Um, that's great. Um, I, I, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, maybe I'll direct to Nat um, a couple of related questions about how, how we translate these, these kinds of data to convince policymakers to make good environmental decisions. Um, do they care about golden crown sparrows? Um, and, and, and how is the Audubon Society engaging with the public on bird migration? Um, so let's see. So let me start first about the, the policy question. And, you know, um, some of those policymakers may care about golden crown sparrows. Um, some of them may not. I think we all care about making sure that the environment is taken care of for both wildlife and people and making sure that, um, you know, to the extent that we can, we're finding common solutions um, that, that, um, that provide benefits for people and wildlife. And we, we've talked about those at, at Point Blue um, as, you know, multiple benefit solutions. Um, and so I think that one of the ways that we can help ensure that people care about golden crown sparrows 
is that we are helping articulate what are those multiple benefit solutions that um, are a path forward on protecting both birds and wildlife. So I think that's what kind of on us to think about, okay, how do we use this information that we have now on migratory birds to better articulate where are the important places to get those multiple benefit conservation solutions in place and what specifically do those need to look like to have the outcomes that we would like to have. Um, and then in response to the question about um, what are we doing at the National Audubon Society? So the Migratory Bird Initiative um, has, a, has a couple of different product, projects going on, but one of the ones that is really exciting is um, building a migratory bird conservation platform that will be an online resource that highlights, um, you know, allows people to explore information about where birds migrate and, and look at some of those tracking data, explore those for themselves, and then use that as a tool to better understand the conservation challenges that birds are exposed to, and also um, highlight the researchers um, that are doing the research and then also the conservationists that are doing those projects on the ground to address those conservation challenges. So making sure that we've got a place where people can get excited, be inspired by bird migration and also understand how that research happens and, and what the conservation needs are. Absolutely, yeah, that sounds great. Um, Thank you for that. Um, I let's see. I have a. I'm going to change gears a little bit with a question about climate change and um, question about whether climate change is affecting migration routes or other aspects of migration. Do we do we know and um, do we expect to see any changes? I mean, I can start off by saying that um, we do know that some birds are already shifting their timing of migration. Um, and so earlier um, or later arrivals in some cases. Um, and we do demonstrate that on the Palos Data Explorer page on our um, climate change page. You can go and check out some species um, where we're seeing those changes. And um, certainly with, um, you know, changes in weather patterns um, we, and, and potentially habitat, we can expect um, that we may see um, sh changes to um, birds migration, either stop over sites, their ability to stop over at certain sites, um, what makes suitable habitat or suitable timing. Um, I, um, yeah, I <laughs> kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, but but habitat changes and change shifts in in climate are certainly um, potential to to impact these these migratory stopover sites pretty pretty hugely. Yeah, yeah, climate change just affects everything in so many ways that I imagine it's hard to predict. Um, yeah, how how migration routes might shift in response. Um, yeah, uh, let's see here. Um, I have a question for Autumn, which is, uh, what does it mean to be a National Geographic Explorer? And, uh, and how can we find out more about that program? Sure, yeah. So that is um, basically a result of getting funding through um, the National Geographic, for me, the Early, early Career Grant Program. Um, and so once you get funding from National Geographic, then you sort of get you know, initiated into the club as a, as a National Geographic Explorer, essentially. Um, and it's, it's a cool way to, to sort of have um, connections with other explorers around the world. Um, and yeah, basically to find grant information from them, I would suggest checking out their website. I know right now because of COVID, they have uh, a lot fewer opportunities, but generally speaking, they have um, a lot of mission areas that are about science, um, conservation, education, storytelling. And so, yeah, it's been a really cool organization to um, get familiar with and be a part of. What a great opportunity. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, I have a couple of questions about, well, let's see, do we know whether our studies are tagging affect bird behavior? 
I guess a little bit different from the um, safety question earlier, but. Um, I think for, I can just speak to the golden crowns and, and what I saw, um, Renee already brought up that, you know, we're seeing the same number come back as control birds. And so it doesn't seem to be affecting that, uh, as far as their behavior, um, I, you know, haven't seen a tech bird on the breeding grounds to know whether something's changing there. Um, but from what I've seen on the wintering grounds, I haven't noticed anything like that. In fact, some birds will come right back into the trap like the next day, <laughs> tagged, um, just really wanting that seed, I guess, and uh, not to put off by it, it seems. Um, but yeah, I think that that's something that's sort of complicated. And I know there, there have been some studies that show for some species that, that tags um, have been a problem for them and other ones that show they haven't. And so I think it's species specific as well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if Renee, if you have maybe other thoughts, but. No, that sounds great. And I think, you know, the continued research and um, questions about um, impacts of our study methods and tags are always good to, to keep investigating. And, and um, yeah, what's what Autumn noted about species by species, you know, something that um, isn't a problem for one species might be for another because of their differences in behavior or um, life history characteristics. So it, it's really important to get to know the species that you're working with as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and not to assume that just because the tags were safe for one that, that, it'll, that it'll be safe for the next one. Um, okay. Um, is there a particular migration route that you're most concerned about? <laughs> and any particular reason? I guess we talk about the Pacific Flyway, but even within the Pacific Flyway, it seems like there's multiple, multiple inland and coastal routes. Um, I think yeah. that that's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nat. <laughs> I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, you know, it's maybe not that there is one that is of particular more concern than another, but just recognizing that they all face really unique challenges. Um, one piece of it that's, so you can think about, um, the Swainson's thrushes that Renee showed that move between coastal California down into Western Mexico. And that is a, a very common migratory pathway for Western migrants. A lot of West Coast migrants um, go to that Western part of Mexico. And you can think that one of the things that is really gonna be a challenge for those Western migrants getting from Western Mexico up to coastal California is crossing um, you know, the Colorado River Delta and then the Central Valley. And these are areas that have been largely, um, you know, changed by agriculture and are now facing drought right now. And so thinking about how the drought will impact those. We saw the, um, the images last year, many of you may have seen of the um, birds that perished during migration, during fall migration. Um, and that was probably associated with some sort of weather event. Um, and then finally, if we move a little bit, um, kind of a little bit farther east and we think about those Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada birds that, and that's more common of the, the central flyway, those birds that funnel down through Central America and they're going across, right? Central America gets really narrow and those birds need to move across some very, um, constrained area. So we think about the river of raptors that goes through Veracruz mm -hmm. and then across Panama and, and into um, South America. So, you know, it's important that we think about how, you know, the potential for wind energy development in some of those really constrained areas could impact bird migration. And wind energy, wind energy development is something that we need, right? We need to do it um, in order to address climate change. And we also need to do it in a way that we make sure that we're not having an impact on migratory birds. So making sure that we understand where those places are and we can mitigate any risks in a, in a sensible way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. 
And I was just going to also point out too that what might be bad for one species might not be for another. So um, <clears throat> I think about golden crown sparrows and, you know, they might like a meadow, an open meadow next to some shrubs. Um, so if there's a fire that comes through an area, for example, and burns a forest and it sort of turns it into that, maybe maybe that's good for golden crowns and maybe it's bad for a forest bird, you know. So it's it's pretty complicated <laughs> um, to see how these changes are going to yeah, happen. Yep, yep. That brings me back to some of our previous webinars about habitat change and bird community change, and it's all it's all complicated. And uh, uh, certain certain habitats and certain changes are going to benefit some species over others. Um, we often think about having a diversity of habitat types um, to support a diversity of birds. That you really need a um, fewer monocultures, more 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 mosaics of habitat types. Um, so same concept here. Um, just over a larger, larger space, potentially. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I, I have seen there's a couple other questions about just kind of more general questions about hallow work and um, population trends and uh, um, other things that Point Blue is doing. And I, I want to thank everybody for those questions. And um, you'll find answers to many of those things on our Data Explorer website. Uh, I would encourage you to check it out there. Um, and I, I, let's see, I think we're going to wrap it up here. I have just a few um, little take home messages to share with you all before we go. Oops. So over here. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are just about out of time and I want to um, thank all of our presenters and all of you who attended and sent in some great questions. Um, if you do have any more questions, you are welcome to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. I have uh, contact information for myself and Renee on the slide here. Um, but before we go, I wanted to wrap up this conversation with some key take home messages for bird migration research and conservation. And um, first, what we've heard today is that new technologies are finally making this research much more feasible and informative from ever smaller GPS tags to light level tags to analyzing stable isotopes. Um, it's not cheap, <laughs> but we're learning so much from, from, from these, uh, these new technologies. And it's not easy, it takes a lot of field work, um, but yeah, we're learning so much. So it's been super valuable. Uh, and through our research, we now know better than ever the multiple places our birds call home and that it's complicated. Birds from coastal California and the Sierra might migrate to very different places with different conservation needs. And we also now know how closely connected we are through these birds to people and conservation efforts happening thousands of miles away. So that conservation and landscape decisions we make here will affect bird populations, ecosystems, and people in other places, and vice versa. Uh, we also recognize better than ever that Palo Marin and California more generally is a crossroads for migratory birds and that conservation efforts in California can simultaneously count as conservation on the breeding grounds, on the wintering grounds, and on migration stopovers, just for different species at different times of the year. Um, so our science is contributing new information to conservation efforts that really span the continent. And by supporting migration research like this, and by supporting conservation and restoration efforts, you can actually have an impact over a very large area. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in today and for your interest in this webinar series. Uh, this, this is actually the final episode we currently have planned, but we may extend this series into the future. Feel free to send us encouragement if you, if you like. Um, we also have lots of other events at Palomarin and across other Point Blue programs. So be sure to sign up so you can find out about those. The, uh, the website is pointblue.org slash sign up at the bottom of the screen there. So thanks again to our speakers and to our, all of our attendees. Have a great afternoon, everyone.